aware of that. And you're good to go. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is a meeting of the Active Transportation Advisory Committee for Halifax Regional Municipality. It's June the 16th. Uh, I'm chairperson person of the committee. My name is Hugh Millward. And um, with us also um, is Douglas Wetmore, who is vice, chair, vice, chair, vice chairperson. Um, and I'm going to go through um, a, a roll call of those present um, just so we can, well, so we know who, who's here, but also so we can check your audio and visual uh, uh, and video. So I'll just go through the, uh, the list here. Councillor Becky Kent, are you here? No, not yet. Um, Annika Ropel? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Um, Miles McCormick? Present, Hugh. Hello. Uh, Paul Berry? Not here, not here yet. Uh, Andrew Taylor? Not here. Milena Casanovicius? Uh, present. I'm here. You're here? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Elizabeth Pugh. Elizabeth. I am here. Okay, thank you. Peter Zimmer. I'm just promoting Peter right now, so oh, just off okay. the meeting. Same with Councillor Back Weekend. Oh, okay. Very good. All right, so we have Councillor Kent and we have Peter Zimmer. Uh, Brittany McLean. I am here. here. I'm just having some issue with my video, but it, can you hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. I'll work on it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You, I have just arrived. It's Becky. I'm not oh, going to be able to stay for the whole meeting, but I'll do my best. I'm probably not going to be on camera, but I'll be listening. Okay, I'm thank you. Very I'm multitasking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Perhaps you can let us know when you leave. Yes, um, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, and with us, we also have uh, Siobhan Witherby, Active Transportation Planner, uh, Katie Campbell, and Elizabeth Wall from the Legislative Support. So I'll provide uh, the land acknowledgement, which is customary. Uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. So we'll move on to item two in the agenda, which is approval of the minutes of the last meeting. The, the draft minutes were sent to you and um, I need a motion to approve the minutes from someone and a seconder. I'll approve, Milena. Thank you, Milena. Second, second, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you. Um, and uh, if there are no no issues involved, I will call the question. All those in favour of the minutes as circulated, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. And anyone opposed, say nay or raise your hand. Hearing no opposition, uh, that is um, that motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Katie, I believe we, we did have a late addition. Yes, so there's two additions to this agenda. The first one is an information item navigating built environment obstacles with low no site, and that's an information item and that's been circulated as well. And the second is an added item related to um, Siobhan's staff update that's also been circulated to members for item 9.1.2. Okay. All right. Uh, and the first one, sorry, was, was the, um, the YouTube video? 
Yep, the YouTube yep. video the link was circulated. Both editions would be connected to the added items agenda. And okay. once this agenda is approved, we'll upload it with the regular agenda. Okay. They just come separately, procedurally. Okay, I think I've got it. Um, okay, so uh, I need a motion to approve the agenda as amended, and I also need a second. I can push that motion, Hugh. Thank you. And a seconder. Second it. Uh, you can't second and, and move. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I moved it, Hugh, and then... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, that, so we have a mover and seconder. I'll call for the question regarding uh, approval of the agenda as amended. Uh, those in favor, uh, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Thank you. And any opposed, say nay and, and raise your hand. So no opposed. Uh, that motion carries as well. Um, number four is business arising out of the minutes. And my understanding is that there was no, there was no business arising. Is that correct, Katie? Yep, that's correct. Thank you. Um, number five, call for declaration of conflict of interest. If anyone feels they have a conflict of interest relating to the agenda as circulated, uh, now is the time to declare it. Okay, no one, I hear no declaration, so that is fine. We'll move on to item six, consideration of deferred business and there is no deferred business from previous meetings. So number seven is correspondence, petitions, and delegations. And uh, Katie, are there, are there, is there any correspondence? Or has there been? Oh, sorry. No correspondence There's received? Correspondence. Okay. And both Katie and committee members, um, are there any petitions that you wish to bring forward? Um, there's been no petitions brought forward to the clerk's office. Okay. And there are no petitions being brought forward by members. Okay, thank you very much. So now we move on to item 7.3, which is a presentation on the Woodside and Shearwater, Woodside to Shearwater Active Transportation Plan. Um, and Courtney Pine is due to present that from Traffic and Engineering. She is an engineer with WSP Engineering Services. Uh, Courtney. Hi. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Perfect, if someone would uh, bring up my PowerPoint presentation, that'd be great. It'll just be one second and I'll pull it up yep. for you. While you're doing that, I'll just kind of do a little spiel that we're going to be doing an open house actually this evening as well. Um, so you can feel free to join us between 7 and 8.30 um, over at the North Woodside Community Center for this evening. And we'll also have another opportunity to see us on Monday at the South Woodside Community Center. I think that one's called something different actually. Hang on. Make it the right title for you guys. Side um, Elementary School. So feel free to join us if you're around. Seeing anything yet? Just one second here. No worries. There you go. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. And just to confirm, I have around 10 minutes or do we have around 15 tonight for presentation? I didn't know there was a time limit actually, so. <laughs> well then, no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> But no more than 15. <laughs> I'll, I'll, there's a lot of information here, so I don't want to feel too rushed going through it. So I'll aim for that 15 minute mark and somebody let me know if I'm getting too close. Okay. All right. Yeah, so thank you so much, Hugh, for the welcome. My name is Courtney. I'm a traffic and transportation engineer, and I'm working with HRM um, on this functional plan to make the connection from the Woodside uh, Ferry Terminal area um, there on Pleasant Street um, all the way through to the Shearwater Flyer, Flyer Trail connection. 
And um, we have some options here for, for you to see and gain feedback on. Um, as I mentioned, we are going through an open house public engagement um, sessions tonight, as well as on Monday evening. Um, also, you might see an online survey that will probably either be live this evening or first thing tomorrow morning for also looking for feedback from residents. So we, we're going through our engagement phase right now, and we want to definitely get your guys' feedback here today. So next slide, please. So a little bit of a project background, as I mentioned, um, this here is uh, one of the recommendations that came out of uh, one of the AT priorities plan here. So we're, it, it's been noted, of course, that this is a prime connection that we want to have made. It's around a three kilometer gap that we currently have in the active transportation network. And this was identified by HRM to fill that gap. As you can see, it's in that dashed uh, green line there in the middle of the plan. Next slide. Just a little bit more information here, just kind of like a bigger picture here. Um, of course, that little red rectangle there in the top left corner um, illustrates that gap I just mentioned. However, once we do fill that gap, um, there's, there's gonna be an opportunity for you to reach um, Porters Lake and Lawrencetown Beach, and then of course, continue on the beautiful active transportation network that continues along the coast there. Next slide. So zooming into what we were focusing on as part of our scope of work for this functional plan, is we really wanted to um, make a, a connection there to the Dartmouth Harborfront Trail um, along Pleasant Street and then make our way over to the Shearwater Flyer Trail um, as our main connections. Also, it was brought up through the RFP process that we wanted to see if there's any opportunity to extend in both directions. So we wanted to go from um, the Dartmouth Harborfront Trail there with a connection to Pleasant Street at Atlantic all the way up to Acadia there to the west. And then um, same thing, but once we make that connection for the Shearwater Flyer Trail um, down on Main Road there, um, we also want to look at making that connection to the existing facilities near Hines Road. Slide. Perfect. Why are we here today? So we want to provide a project update. Um, we also want to introduce some of the routing and the concept design options that we're currently looking at now, and of course showing the remaining public there to gain feedback. Um, we are currently looking for feedback on these options and are looking for any other um, active transportation needs or preferences along this corridor. Um, we're going to have some evaluation criteria that we'll be capturing at the end and just discussing the project next steps. Next slide. Perfect. So this is kind of the first chunk of the study area. This goes from Acadia Street all the way through to around the Imperial Oil intersection. Um, what we see here is just some key um, components along the corridor. We have some signalized intersections. Um, in this case, in this block here, we have five. We also have some uh, marked and um, upgraded signalized, uh, not signalized, pardon me, but RA5 crossings along the corridor. Um, if, as um, you can see here, we have the Dartmouth Harborfront Trail that we're trying to make a connection to that's near the Woodside Ferry Terminal, as well as the Maltese Pathway that's currently on Atlantic Street. And uh, that, this is the gap that we're trying to fill along this corridor. Right, next slide. So now we're on the second half of the project. So essentially from that Imperial Oil signalized intersection all the way through over to Bonaventure and Hines Road. Um, this here is, as I say, the, the more Eastern portion of our study as well as one signalized intersection at Bonaventure. And we just highlight the Shearwater Flyer Trail there as a, a prime connection opportunity. Um, one thing I wanna note here is of course, we do have the CN Railway that's shown in a purple dash. Um, so we do have some um, railway crossings to um, include as well in, as part of our review. Next slide. So if you've ever traveled along this corridor, you do realize that we do have some uh, project challenges is what we like to say. We have a couple property constraints that we're keeping an eye on there, depending on the option that's selected. We do have a couple busy intersections. Um, of course, um, if, you, if you have traveled through here, um, the Nova Scotia Highway 111 does terminate at this location at Pleasant Street, as well as of course, we do have some heavy vehicle volumes here at this intersection as well. Um, we do have a couple pinch points along the corridor. Um, there are two that we're looking at there. One is um, where the CN Railway crossing is um, crossing over um, Pleasant Street there um, down towards Belmont Avenue. And we also have some of the Imperial Oil infrastructure that is around a pinch point as well. Um, of course, I mentioned that we have the railway that's near the study area as well for the, more of the Eastern portion of the project. And I, and I did mention that we have industrial traffic and heavy vehicles along the corridor. 
So those are just some of the challenges. Of course, there's a long list, um, but those are just some of the key challenges that we've um, taken into account as we've pulled together design options. Next slide. Correct. So what we've done here is um, we completed an overview there for our routing. We, pr we pretty much had the routing kind of picked out essentially to kind of make our way from Acadia Street all the way through to Hines Road with a connection there down to Woodside Ferry Terminal to get onto the Dartmouth Harbor Front Trail. Um, what we ended up doing is we broke this into four different chunks or segments along the corridor. What these are trying to illustrate here is the Pleasant Street segment is shown in kind of the P, the red area, the Imperial Oil segment's in the blue, the M is the main road segment, and then the pink with the W is the Woodside Ferry Terminal segment. So that's how we've kind of broken it down as this is a very long corridor and we didn't want to overwhelm it too long. We wanted to kind of be able to chunk it down and um, be able to visually see it better. Next slide. Perfect. Jumping into the concept options. Um, so the colors that you're gonna see here, I'm going through all the options are consistent. So if you see anything that's green, um, that's a multi-use pathway. If you see anything that's blue, that's illustrating the sidewalk. And anything in pink is a bi-directional bikeway. And then of course, what's not on the screen here yet, but yellow will be any on-street facilities that are like unidirectional. I'll also do my best to explain as I know there's some visually impaired and blind that are on the call. Anywhere that you see a solid line is representing existing. Anywhere that you see a dash line is a proposed or a future planned facility. All right, that's a little bit of a, the legend that you have here. So jumping into option P1, this here is that first section that we're looking at. So we're going from Acadia Street on our left, all the way through to Highway 111 um, as our intersection point. Um, this option here is recommending to maintain the existing on both sides of the corridor that are currently there. Um, this option is looking at introducing a proposed bi-directional bikeway on the southern side or the water side of Pleasant Street here. Just kind of absorb that there. Um, at the intersection of Atlantic and Pleasant, we would make a connection to the multi-use pathway there to ensure that the bi-directional facility would flow um, fluidly into the Atlantic Street facility. Next slide. This is what it may look like. So just to explain it. So on the left side is the hospital side or the Dartmouth General side. On the right side is the water side. So what we're seeing here is um, actually one lane of traffic in each direction with a, a left turning lane there in the center. And we'd actually be taking away a lane along this corridor here and introducing precast curb for our proposed bi-directional facility. So just in case some are not familiar with Pleasant Street, it's currently a four lane cross section. In most cases, two lanes in each direction with some dedicated turning lanes at the intersection. Um, this option here does take away a lane. However, um, still provides a turning lane there in the center and at the intersection approaches, we'd have the appropriate turning lanes applied as well. What we're looking at here is around a three meter wide um, bi-directional facility and using precast curb there as our protection uh, with some, of course, um, flexible bollards and um, thermoplastic green zebra painting at uh, conflict or driveway areas. Next slide. Now we're into another option, same block we're looking at. So it's Acadia to Highway 111. However, now we're changing up the facility style. So in this case here, we'd be recommending from Acadia to Atlantic to maintain the sidewalk on the water side or the Southern side. We'd also be looking um, to replace or upgrade, yeah, I guess you could, depending on how you look at it, on the other side of the street there to multi-use pathway walk on that side and this would be behind the curb. Then at the intersection of Atlantic and Pleasant there with the Woodside Ferry Terminal, um, we want to cross to the other side of the street there to assist us with getting through um, the channelized right turns at Highway 111. So we would switch the side. So then in this case here the Maltese pathway would replace the sidewalk on the bottom of the page and then of course the sidewalk would remain on the other side. Um, next slide please. This here is a little visual. So this is that first piece I talked about. So again, the left side of the screen is closest to the hospital or Dartmouth General. And then the, uh, the right side of the screen there is the existing sidewalk that would remain. We do have a little bit of a grade change here. So this is kind of representing a cross section near the Dartmouth General. Next slide. Whereas this cross section here is more illustrating that section between Atlantic and Highway 111. So as you can see, the multi-use pathway has now switched to the other side of the street. Again, it, both are behind the, the existing curb um, for both of those um, segments. However, um, they're just on the other side of the street. 
One thing to note here, um, for this option, for both segments, um, we wouldn't be touching the existing curb to curb spacing. So therefore, we'd remain at a four or a five lane cross section within that block. Slide. So that was Pleasant Street segment. We're now gonna jump into the next segment, which is the Woodside Ferry Terminal segment. Next slide. Courtney, can, can I just get a little bit of clarification to make sure that each time you show the options, you're showing from the perspective that the hospital is always on the left? in the yep. pit photo okay and will you be staying on with that perspective of the street the whole way down in all these sections i believe so yes okay thank you this here is um two options that we've come up with for the woodside um connection so both options are multi-use pathway um the first option which is on the left side of the screen illustrates a multi-use pathway um on more the northern section of uh I guess you say Atlantic Street there heading towards the ferry terminal. So kind of between the parking lot and the roadway itself, we'd have a multi-use pathway and that would connect into the Dartmouth Harbor Front Trail. Whereas option two is more so um, on, I think, is it Harvey's that's there, but the other side of the Atlantic Street and then coming, coming through the center of that medium parking um, where there's nose in parking um, where the buses kind of loop around. So that's pretty much the main difference between these two is that one is kind of more removed a more outlining of the parking lot, whereas the other one kind of goes through the parking lot. Of course, with option two, you might have a few more conflict or, or crossing um, points there through that option. Next slide. All right, now we're jumping into the Imperial Oil segment along Pleasant Street for the corridor. Next slide. So option I1, illustrates um, maintaining the existing sidewalk on the top of the page, um, and then the proposed multi-use pathway on the bottom of the page or the water side. Um, so this would be along the whole corridor, all the way from Highway 111, all the way through to Carlton Street. Next slide. This here is a depiction of what it could look like. Um, so again, the existing sidewalk is on um, more of the the top of the page, as I had mentioned before, and as Kathy helped me out with uh, figuring that out. And then the multi-use pathway is on the right side there, which is the water side. One thing to note is that there's currently some fencing along the, both sides of the corridor here. We may be able to remove that during the project. That's something that we're looking for feedback on um, for user comfortability, as well as experience. Um, so that's something that we're asking the group here on the call, as well as at the open house this evening. Um, we're proposing a three meter actual multi-use pathway along the corridor. Next slide. Option I2 is, is, is similar, however, similar facility, but it's on the other side of the street there. So in this case here is on the top of the page where we'd actually switch at Everett Street. So from Highway 111, we'd be on the water side, but as we proceeded to Everett Street at the signalized intersection, that'd be the, our opportunity to cross to the other side of the street. Um, so again, same facilities. Um, however, we'd have a new sidewalk proposed on the water side and then new multi-use pathway on the other sides, so more than northern side. Next slide. In this case here, um, the multi-use path is on the northern side there would um, replace the existing sidewalk and there'd be a new sidewalk on the water side. Same facility width, so three meters with um, asphalt surface for the multi-use pathway. So the main difference between option I1 and I2, uh, and then of course coming into I3, is that I1 and I2 um, maintain the existing um, face a curve to face a curve along Pleasant Street, meaning but all four lanes are retained, so two lanes in each direction. Option I3 actually looks at an option here where we can use it as an on-road bi-directional protective facility for our bicycle facility. So in this case here, we'd have our existing sidewalk there on um, the top of the page or the more the northern eastern side. And then um, from Highway 111 through to Carlton Street, we'd actually have a bi-directional facility. So if you go to the next slide there, it'll give you a better visual. And what we're seeing here is, again, the sidewalk is, is there, it will remain. But in this case here, our four lanes have now become one in each direction with a dedicated median there in the center for any left turning opportunities into roadways or um, I guess you say dedicated driveway locations and also providing a turning lane at signalized intersections. So again, what we see here, similar to what we saw back on the first or one of the options there for Pleasant Street 
is a bi-directional facility that would have precast curb and some uh, bollards there included to provide that protection and it'd be a two-way facility with a three meter wide surface. Next slide. All right, jumping into the last section is main road segment. So we can jump right into that. Next slide. So this here is continuing from Carlton Street. So again, each of these kind of flow into each other. So we'd be continuing from Carlton Street for our first option that we looked at. So there's a lot going on in this picture. So of course, what we're showing here, remember, is the solid lines are existing facilities. So what we have here is the Shearwater Flyer Trail is more towards the eastern side there of our facility and some sidewalk facilities mixed in. So option M1 is taking a multi-use pathway along the water side and continuing along and connecting into the intersection of Bonaventure and Main Road. This is where you then transition from a multi-use pathway to the existing um, painted bike lanes that are currently on Heinz Road. In this option here, we'd recommend to extend the existing um, painted bike lanes there from Heinz Road up to Bonaventure just to continue the facility and then have the crossing opportunity at Bonaventure where it's signalized. We're also providing a suggestion of having a crossing there to get onto Corsair Drive, where there's an opportunity to connect into to the Shearwater Flyer Trail, and the same thing at um, Swordfish with a connection from the Flyer Trail down to the existing um, transit stop that's currently there with some dedicated sidewalk proposed to make that connection. Slide, please. Here is what um, the multi-use pathway could look like along Main Road. So again, we're looking at that three meter wide asphalt surface. And in this case here, um, we wouldn't be touching the curb to curb spacing for the roadway. So we'd have the four lanes of traffic. Next slide. Option M2, um, what we'd have here instead of the multi-use pathway would be a bi-directional bikeway facility. So again, as, as you've heard along, as we kind of introduced the bi-directional bikeway, this is where we would take a lane um, of the four that are currently along the roadway corridor. And we take that and kind of absorb that as our active transportation facility. So if you go to the next slide there, I'll be able to show the visual. So here, as I mentioned previously, we'd have a, a lane in each direction. Um, we'd have a painted median in this case here um, to allow for opportunities for a dedicated left turn lane as required along the corridor and or turning lanes at the intersections. Um, again, precast curb, ballers, and a three meter wide bi-directional facility with approximately 1.5 meter asphalt sidewalk that's currently there. And we'd, uh, we'd suggest to leave that as is and we just would work within the curb space. Next slide. That was a lot of information. I know, I, I hope I'm getting close to my time or I'm staying near it, but um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna gain all the feedback there from the public at tonight's session, at Monday's session. Um, one thing to also note, um, we haven't scheduled them yet, but we do plan to do a pop-up at the Woodside Ferry Terminal, hopefully next week, as well as um, another location to be determined, um, just to kind of gain some feedback there from people that are walking by and just kind of get some on the spot information and we'll be summarizing all of that. I also mentioned there's gonna be an online survey that we're gonna take some feedback on as well. A lot of the information you saw here today will be repeated in that survey. So of course, excuse me, if you have any family or friends, of course, that may not be able to attend the open house or not a chance to get to the pop-up, the online survey is um, the best way to kind of provide your feedback, any suggestions, comments, um, anything that you'd like to change, of course, we'll be taking that into account. This kind of leads into our evaluation criteria of all the options you just saw. So some things that we'll be looking at after we get all that feedback is we'll be comparing each of those options for those segments. And we're gonna be looking for connectivity, directness and cohesion. So one thing to keep in mind, even though we did break it up into segments, we won't be doing a different facility along each quarter unless there, um, it makes sense, I guess you could say, depending on the block that we're on. We're hopefully gonna have more of a cohesion look through the whole area. Um, of course, this is meant to be a triple A, so an all ages and abilities facility. So we'll be looking for comfort for all users. Safety and accessibility are of course at the top most importance here, because of course this is a busy corridor and that's an opportunity there with that reduction of the lanes there, it will definitely um, look at uh, reducing some speeds along those corridors as well as it'll be uh, one lane of traffic compared to two. Um, something we will be taking into account, of course, is traffic, transit and rail impacts. Um, any Im impacts to the environment, utilities and properties along the corridor. As I did mention, the feedback there from our stakeholders, um, both public and key stakeholders um, will be taken into account. 
Um, we will be meeting with HRM. There is a technical committee assigned to this project. So we'll be meeting with them after we gain all this information and co complete this comparison to get their feedback. And of course, we'll be also taking into account costs and ease of implementation. Next slide. So here's just a little list of where we currently are. So of course, we've done a lot of the project um, to date. As I mentioned, we're currently going through our engagement right now. So of course, that's what we're gonna be experiencing in June. Our goal then will be to meet with HRM. Hopefully, vacations don't block too many time slots there, but we'd be looking to meet around early to middle of July to gain their feedback. And then we'd be taking the preferred option there, bringing it to a 30% design, also known as a functional plan, and wrapping that all up into a report and hopefully um, submitting there at the end of the summer of this year. Maybe fall, we'll see how everything goes for scheduling. And this, next slide. There we go, that's everything. Of course, I know I went a little bit fast through some parts there. Of course, you're welcome to come see us again tonight. This exact same presentation will be um, up on the screen there. I'll be working through it as well as we'll have HRM representatives there to answer any questions as well. Do we have any time for questions <laughs> or if there right. are any? <laughs> it was a lot, I know, it was a lot, it's a big corridor. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. Uh, yes, awesome. I can see there, there is a lot there and uh, I would yep. encourage members to uh, uh, give their input uh, through the process you've just met, mentioned, but, but even so, uh, we should uh, ask for questions and concerns right now. And I'm going to go through our speaking list in order, starting with Councillor Becky Kent. Thank you. I, I'm gonna forgo my questions at this minute. Um, other than because I don't want to tie it up, I think there's there's this is an opportunity for the group to ask it. I'm going to have lots of chances. I'm I'll be at the meeting tonight and next week, and in meetings with staff on this. Um, a, a couple of things that I do want to raise that uh, is worth talking about, I guess, in, in in this context is this particular corridor has four lanes of traffic, and it is a major and almost it's a primary entryway into the community of Eastern Passage, Shearwater, Cow Bay, um, uh, as, the, as the, the main entrance. It is also extremely busy and unsafe with a lot of speeding. So the potential options for something that reduces the uh, corridor to a two lane could help a lot with that, but it's also a major corridor for industry trucking and transportation, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of that. So there's a bit of a, a contradictory, potentially some contradictory challenges and pros and cons because you've got two competing really op opposing features to, from pedestrian and active transportation versus vehicle. So um, I just, uh, that's a conversation, Courtney, I'm gonna wanna have with you and Dave further. I, I look forward to hearing everyone's comments. Um, so thank you for doing this. Uh, it's a, I think it's welcome. And I like some of the suggestions you've got on here, but we'll have to see where we land. Uh, at this stage, Courtney, my question for you is, has traffic seen any of this? Yes, <laughs> short and, answer, okay. yes. Okay. And um, at this time, um, tra HRM traffic, I don't wanna to speak too much for them, of course, but they'll be part of our technical committee there. and. As these options were being developed, they were part of the review committee and they do support the options that we are showing um, okay, today good. and of course this evening and through the engagement process. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kent. Um, uh, Annika Ropel, questions or concerns? Yeah, hi. It's uh, always fun going first. <laughs> I feel like I'll probably have more <laughs> later on. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the consistency of facilities along that path was definitely something that I'm glad to hear is, is being considered. Um, really excited to see this uh, being connected both. Uh, it just feels like that's a long time coming. So it's exciting to see some proposals. Um, I have questions around how many conflict areas there are along those routes of when it's on one side of the road or when it's on the other side of the road, when it's a multi-use path versus a bi-directional bike path. I think that that would really factor into how I feel about some of those options about, and I imagine that's also on your radar, but yeah, I'm, you know, always very cognizant of intersections being uh, where conflicts happen, um, which isn't fun. Um, I 
think uh, that connection um, from the Dartmouth uh, Dartmouth um, waterfront trail up to the path that's kind of through that parking lot area. I was kind of wondering why there wasn't a third option that had that path because right now it's kind of going over top and connecting or through. Was there an option or a consideration for going alongside that sidewalk um, so that you'd have the sidewalk and then that multi like a multi-use path there, not replacing the sidewalk, but just um, scooching along the underside, if you will. Um, wondering what the purpose of the fencing is along that road. <laughs> um, and that is all I have off of the top of my head right now. And I'm sure I'll think of more and I will go fill out a survey. So don't you worry. Definitely do the survey. I think I got three things from that. So yes, conflict or driveways or roadway crossings, of course, are a big factor, of course, or a factor, I guess you could say, when looking at a multi-use pathway compared to, say, a bi-directional facility. Um, one thing you may have seen there that we try to sneak on different sides of intersections there as much as possible as, for example, the Highway 111, you have two channelized right turns. No one likes crossing a channelized right turn, especially when vehicles are looking to speed up to 80 to get onto the Highway 111. So, of course, we took that into account, but other driveways, other intersections will feed into that evaluation that we'll do for the options. So, yes, that is being considered and taken into account. The second thing there for, I believe it was um, the Woodside connection. I'm gonna go to that one. Um, we did look at that. There's not a whole lot of space. Um, of course, that's where all the transit vehicles do pull in there to load and unload there for the Woodside Ferry Terminal. Um, we've heard from some different projects that having a facility there um, with an existing sidewalk facility can be quite, I guess, congested if there's not the appropriate space. Um, as I mentioned, we are quite tight for property there. Um, I, I believe there is a grade change. There might be a lot of infrastructure required, but we did look at that and we just kind of eliminated as an option because of some other large constraints. However, of course, if we hear a big push from the public here to, um, tonight or through the engagement process, we'll keep that in mind. Third one was... <laughs> What's the purpose of the fencing? There we go. So... What we wanted to illustrate there is what was currently within the facility. So, um, of course, as I don't know if, how long you've been in Halifax, but that used to be a refinery. Of course, the fencing, I believe, was installed to for protection, of course, as well as safety for the property that was there. Um, some feedback we've already heard through the technical committee was let's take it out if we can. Um, so that is something that we're taking into account and, of course, looking for feedback on. And I'll be at almost saying the exact similar presentation tonight. Um, and bringing up the fencing is going to be part of it. So we'll see what the public says. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, those responses. Um, Miles McCormick. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the presentation. One of my questions uh, segues from that is the Atlantic Street you were showing on there that there is a connector going that way. Uh, I think there's opportunity there for this proposed development at Mount Hope. So that's something that I wonder, is that in the back somewhere, uh, aspects of this plan tying in for, for when the proposed affordable housing development takes place? So of course, we're just focusing right on Pleasant Street and Main Road through our corridor. And of course, it's making you know, those connections on the side streets. Um, that's definitely something, um, if you want to complete the online survey, definitely yeah. capture it there. But I, I had that highlighted. That, <laughs> yeah. that was my question because I was looking online trying to see what the connector was going up Atlantic. When I looked at the map, I said, this would be a natural link to bring yeah. people to the ferry terminal and to go uh, east of uh, both sides of the trail. So that, that's something that's on my mind about this. Yeah, so of course, we're just focusing right on Pleasant Street, but of course, um, that's definitely a great point to bring up, and we'll flag that in our What We Heard report that summarizes all the engagement, and that will be brought to HRM's attention. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Miles. Just uh, to respond to that myself, um, the, uh, the, the connection there is via the Mount Hope Greenway. Okay. Uh, which actually takes you to the very end of what is current, uh, the dead end of Mount Hope. Uh, if that development occurs that you're mentioning, uh, it would, it, you know, it's a natural to lead straight into that community. Yeah. Uh, but but it, the current connection goes from the Mount Hope Greenway to the Baker Drive Greenway to the Portland Lakes Greenway. It goes all yeah. the way through um, pretty well to Portland Hills Terminal. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's yeah. move on. Unless, did you have any, any more questions, Miles? No, that's it. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Did Paul Barry join us or not? No. And Andrew Taylor? Andrew also. Taylor. Has oh, ho hello, Andrew. I didn't realize you joined us. Uh, do you have questions or concerns? No? I believe Andrew is muted right now. No, oh. not, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, Milena Casanovicius. You like saying that last name, don't you, Mr. Chair? <laughs> I hope he's getting it right, Milena, for you. <laughs> he's, he's, getting, he's getting there. He's getting there. Hi, Courtney. Nice to see Hi. you again. Um, nice to see you I as well. <laughs> I just want to commend um, your team in particular for really uh, going out there and surveying a lot of people in every format possible. <clears throat> one, which I think has been lacking for a bit, but but we're we're starting to change that. It's important to get everyone's voices. Um, I'm not going to play my broken record here to the committee, and then I'm going to say something that might be a little bit unfavorable at the end. When all of this development is happening for active transportation cost must not even be considered. I'd, I'd like to see that at the top, along with safety um, for all. Um, <clears throat> to make all these streets as safe as possible. It's, you know, it, if there's money to be put somewhere, put it towards the safety. Um, second, and I had a beautiful meeting with Siobhan and, and her colleague uh, Ruby yesterday um, about another project that's, that's being developed um, under AT. Um, I'm starting to notice, which is irritating me and forgive me with this committee, but I'd really like for everyone to think we are under the IMP and the hierarchy is pedestrian, bicycle, bus, vehicles. The push for the bicycle paths is starting to overwhelm and override pedestrians, particularly those who are vulnerable, disabled, and let's just throw all pedestrians, parents with strollers, um, people using wheelchairs, the elderly. This must not occur. We, we, we have to keep our pedestrians in mind because the truth of the matter, I'm going to say this, to ride a bicycle for the most part is a bit of a privilege. Not always, because not everybody can afford a bike. We already know that. And especially people low income and who are uh, disabled, their option is to walk or bus. And if they've got the money to taxi. If you're an able-bodied person, your option is you can bike. Hopefully that's what you're choosing. You can drive if you've got a car, you can take the bus or you can take a taxi. So it's, and, and I will throw this in and then, and then I will stop my violin <laughs> solo here that, you know, even on, on CBC in this month alone, I've heard it probably about four times, the announcement to um, vehicular traffic, watch your right on red in order not to hit a bicycle. When have we ever heard watch your right on red in order not to hit a pedestrian? I'm all for active transportation. I'm gonna remind people I have a tandem bike. I do wanna be protected in, the, in a safe lane, but we must not forget the pedestrian. First and foremost, bikes after, and dividing the bicycle and the pedestrian is of high importance to me. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thanks for doing description. And yeah. that's the end of my thought. <laughs> Perfect. No, of course. And that's great yeah. feedback. And we are hearing that. And of course, um, one thing there is I want to note that in that evaluation criteria list, it wasn't necessarily in order of importance. It just, of course, was just capturing all the criteria that we do look at. So, of course, cost does is a big role, of course, whenever somebody sees some bigger dollar signs than what they're expecting. Yeah. But safety and accessibility is usually, of course, um, a very important um, piece that we look at. Yeah. And, and, and I guess, I guess, I guess, Courtney, that that was more for for Councillor Kent. I'm smiling at you <laughs> um, that that, you know, that um, that uh, that that gets spread through HRM and City Council. Um, it, it's it's just uh, yeah, it's it's getting a little too much anyway. Um, great progress. So thank you. And now I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> thank you for your feedback. OK, thank you, Milena, um, for that. Uh impassioned speech, which uh, I'm sure we'll all take to heart. Um, let's move on to Elizabeth Pugh. Hi, Courtney. Elizabeth. How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> You're outside. Loving my Yeti mug. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, no, thank you for the presentation. That was great. I guess I don't think I can say anything that you wouldn't have already thought of. Um, but I guess just in interest of, of you know, whatever. Um, I'm also a fan, as you probably know, of keeping the cyclists and the pedestrians separated. So I do like the idea of the bi-directional bike lanes uh, plus sidewalk rather than multi-use trail. Multi-use trails are great for recreational, you know, going through the middle of nowhere, but I, I really don't like them for commuting type of stuff because cyclists who are wanting to get somewhere are going quickly and want to go quickly and should go quickly. Um, I'm also not a big fan of bi-directional bike lanes on two lane roads. Um, and I'm sure that there's no choice here because I know you probably would have thought of that, but I am curious if you thought of um, cycle tracks on either side of that road, especially where you've got 3.7 meter lanes, which are huge. We only use those on our 100 series highways. We wouldn't put them on something like Pleasant Street. So I'm just wondering if there might have been an option, especially if you're getting rid of a, potentially getting rid of a lane to, to have one way cycle tracks on, on either side. But again, that might not hook up nicely with either end. So um, I'm not looking for answers. I'm just going to throw this stuff out there. Um, I think that's really all I had. Well, that's definitely great feedback. And of course, um, one thing that we took into account is this, the bi-directional option there to reduce the lanes. Of course, if we hear um, in the feedback there that unidirectional is more attractive, of course, that does mean double the infrastructure for precast curb and ballers. So it does increase the cost along the corridor. However, in some spots there, it might be more appropriate to have a unidirectional similar to the Wise Road facility. Yeah, I think it's, I think Bi-directional on, on bi-directional gets very confusing because people are not looking for cyclists coming at them on the opposite side of the road. And um, of course, then you're asking people to cross if they want to get to, to stuff, but there may not be stuff to get to. So, yeah. No, oh, great feedback. Thank great. you. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Peter Zimmer. Peter. Hi. Very much. At my uh, it's the vulnerable road users take them as which I say includes in their stroller seats on up through people who are using micro mobility in its various guises. Some of it is disability scooters. Some of it is uh, stuff that really only interests a young, very athletic person. Uh, I saw somebody in Lunenburg on a single wheeled electric skateboard or something, you know, whipping around, very agile, very impressive. But we have an increasing amount of individual Haligonians and corporate Haligonians promoting the ideas of micromobility, of electric scooters, e-bikes, e-cargo bikes, e-trishaws. I just rode one for Cycling Without Age today around the city streets. Uh, the question I've got is, are these plans that seem to be dealing with a pipeline for pedestrians, a pipeline for cyclists, a highway for cars and motor vehicles, and where the heck are all these other people going to be? They're going to find a way to use their devices. And I think the planners really have to be looking, saying five, 10 years down the road uh, is a proportion of e-bikes to cyclists to scooter users going to shift and where is it going to shift? Uh, second big point, I quite agree with the cautions and concerns of seeing the bike lane flip from one side of the highway to the other. Uh, I wonder what traffic devices you are looking at for getting it so we don't have lots of clashes between the different types of mobility at those intersections. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, rotaries are a good solution, but we, have to, we really have to spend a lot of time because whatever you build this year is gonna be bugging us for the next two or three decades. Um, final point, somebody said recently, and it really reflected, paint is not infrastructure. I don't think the painted bike lanes uh, are treated as being worth, um, I won't use the expletive, uh, but certainly city crews do not pay attention. Drivers do not pay attention. Construction people working and dumping their gravel across bike lanes like on Bell Road don't pay attention. Uh, 
the painted bike lanes are almost a hazard that I try to avoid. And I've been cycling for 50 years. I don't think they are a big improvement. And I would say, I would like all of the planners to take them off their drawing boards and figure out how to really have a bike lane or a multi-user lane or a, I don't know what you call them because we're getting more and more vehicles of different types, different sizes, different speeds. And they're all vying for space on the public commons. That's our mobility system. And, uh, you know, that's what I see as, as a systematic failure. And the other failure that I see that I want to call attention to is the bloody siloing of everything. You have communications people, you have engineers, you have planners, you have, you know, on and on. And I don't get the sense that they bloody talk to each other or listen to each other or read the same books. Um, you know, at some point I'd like to do is a friend who told me the cure for cats who don't get on is you close them up in a box and you close down the lid and you shake it really hard. And they're also traumatized. They come out and they're actually nice to each other and for the rest of the world. There's times when I look. Oh, okay, <laughs> thanks a lot, Peter. That you, yeah. you've given it. Okay. That's th three questions that I counted, and uh, yeah, or may mostly it, it was commentary, I think, rather than questions. But uh, I got two out of there. Um, in regards <laughs> to micro mobility, um, that's definitely a bigger conversation that Atrium, I think, will have to have internally. Of course, we've been scoped there to truly look at the AAA facility there to make that connection from the two facilities, Dartmouth Harbor Front Trail and the Shearwater Flyer Trail, to ensure that um, we can get our cyclists and, of course, continue the use there for pedestrians with that connection. So, of course, that's a bigger, bigger question that I can't answer today and that Atrium definitely will have to include as part of the repertoire. And hopefully, communications planner engineers are being friendly and are, are hopefully speaking to it. Of course, I'm an engineer, so I kind of can't speak to what Atrium does internally, but in-house, we are very cohesive at WSP. There was a third question there. I'm, I'm just not remembering it. You guys are the triple whammy today. <laughs> I got two. Yeah, what was the third Peter, one? Peter, <laughs> do you remember the third piece? <laughs> not about the cats in the box. Silos. It was silos. Oh, that was the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's an HRM thing, too, that they'll, they'll work on as communication yeah. and for different projects. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Peter. Uh, Brittany McLean. I don't have any questions, but I just have two, and I'll be quick. Uh, just two comments. So I'm an urban planner, so I'm coming at you from an urban planning background, but um, I tend to, and this, I, I will fill out the survey as well, but um, I tend to um, feel more uh excited about the ones where you're looking at reducing lanes right and especially for uh like melina was saying pedestrian crossings i know there's been a few fatalities in the last few years on that section of road especially down around the hospital um so i would love to see options where you're incorporating reducing lanes there i know further down it gets a little bit trickier because you've got um bigger vehicles coming off of the 111 highway there and then turning down by the imperial the old imperial lands um, but I do feel like uh, as far as you can, uh, it would be ideal to see some things where you're minimizing lanes there. Um, my only other comment, and this is just coming from being a user of this pathway, is that you had a section there by the um, Woodside Ferry Terminal. Uh, and it was it looked like option A was to kind of go up and around the parking lot and then another was to go through. And it looked like the option to go through the parking lot shows a crossing at Atlantic Street. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. I don't know the presentation in front of me. That's what I saw. Um, You're just probably right. To make, yep. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that I do actually cross through there, kind of like cut through the parking lot. That is like, you know, the preferred travel way. It's the quickest way to jump off that path. But that crossing is really, really dangerous. And I've crossed it like with children on a bike before as well. 
it's the way the um, the grading is there. You've got trucks coming down from down toward the water at Atlantic Street, and that's really a blind corner. So I don't know what your stop sighting distances are for there. And I know there's a driveway cut as well. But just if you do pursue that option, just keep that in mind. It is really, really dangerous to try to cross the street either as a pedestrian or as a cyclist there. Um, so those were my two comments. No questions, just kind of comments. And I'll add those yep. to the survey as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just to be clear, though, that, that intersection is where the Tim Hortons is. I, and I, so she's speaking further down where you have to come across and like it's around the corner. So as you're coming down the hill on the curve, they need to get to the median. So it's not up at Pleasant. It's actually further down. And she is correct. There wasn't there would be a I crossing see. there. Yeah. Yeah, I see. OK. Uh, OK, well, thank you. Um, Douglas Wetmore. Thank you, Hugh. A um, few comments and questions from me. Um, definitely a little confused with the two options going through the Woodside Terminal. I'm almost wondering if there could almost sort of be a mix of the two. Sure. Um, looking at the two options, if you kind of started with the first option where you went above kind of the whole parking lot area, uh, but then instead of crossing Atlantic Street up top by the intersection, maybe cross closer to the terminal, kind of where it's lower, that way you don't have as much moving traffic from the intersection and it's just the people kind of coming down the street and out of the terminal. I'm wondering if maybe that would be a safer option than safer option than crossing right up at the top intersection. That would kind of be my preferred method, a, a merge of the two. Um, thinking about all the options going along Pleasant and Main, um, I'm going to speak to both you and Councillor Kent on this one. Um, thinking about the existing Dartmouth Trail, I probably use it maybe once or twice a month. Um, anything beyond Woodside, I can probably count on my hand how many times I've visited since I've moved to Nova Scotia. So the idea of actually being able to extend that path is already promising it's all right. It's very promising of how many times I'm going to be able to go a little bit further, visit um, Eastern Passage, visit all the sort of commercial that's down that way. So that's very exciting to me personally. However, that being said, if I get to Woodside Terminal and I have to cross that four lanes of traffic just to get to the other side of the bike lane, I can almost guarantee that I'm just going to turn around and go back to Alderney. Um, I know there's some conflict between the committee when it comes to bi-directional bike lanes and the um, unidirectional that wasn't really proposed here. Um, I guess given what we're working with with Pleasant Main Street, I'm okay with the uh, bi-directional that's been proposed, but if you could just keep it consistent which side it's on the whole way down, um, if you're going to be crossing multiple lanes of traffic, multiple ways just to get to the end of it, again, that's, I feel like that's just going to deter travelers like me from even bothering, or even worse, it's going to entice people to bike on the sidewalk or bike where they don't belong, and then to get into Milena's argument mixed with pedestrians, which I'm slowly starting to realize um, whenever I don't cycle anywhere that it is a growing problem. Um, feedback, thank only, you. Yeah. The only other comment I had, um, I forget, so you luck out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, sure. Douglas. Um, so did, did you have a response to that, by the way, Courtney, or? Yeah, so in regards to kind of the criteria there, of course, we keep it nice and, I guess, not short, but we, we don't have everything there that we do look at the evaluation, but of course, the crossings and the number of crossings and the cohesiveness and part of that is the cohesiveness of the facility type itself, but then also along the corridor itself. Um, we don't want you to be crossing at, at every intersection just to get to the best side along the corridor for a facility. We want to make the facility work within the road that we have and have the, I guess you say the the best suited for that corridor as much as possible. So definitely staying on one side of the corridor is definitely a big advantage here, especially since it's so long in some pieces. Okay, I, thank I did you. remember my other thing. Uh, do you mind if I share it or are you gonna cut me off you? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one's probably gonna be talking to Councillor Kent a little bit more. Um, going back to the whole four lanes versus two lanes. 
Um, I'm wondering how, and this, this isn't anything I'm looking for an answer to, this is more so common for thought. I'm wondering how perhaps we could work with Halifax Transit to get some more cars off that road, because I know right now, a lot of the bus service ends at Woodside Terminal, and I believe only branches 6B and 6C go out that way, which is every half hour, hour regularly. I'm wondering if maybe there'd be opportunity to get some express routes in there during peak hours and try to get a lot of that top traffic from private vehicles off that road into buses. And then maybe we the only traffic we're worrying about is then that big commercial and industrial and of course the transit vehicles going through. So that, that's just my five cents for uh, Councillor Kent to consider. <laughs> Thank you. Did you want to come back on that, Councillor Kent? No? Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate your comments, and um, I will. It's actually really helpful for me to have had this conversation here. Transit has been actually diminished in this part of the district more recently, with the intention that there's better connections once folks get in. But I've been we've been I've been a champion of more transit out this way for a long time. It's been an uphill battle. Um, I also want to note, if I, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, to speak to um, uh, uh, Malena's comment about her, you know, being a bit of a pest with all this. I don't know what your words, that's the wrong word, but your contribution is really, really important in these conversations. So don't ever consider yourself to be that in particular, to give me feedback that I can share with my colleagues on Transportation Standing Committee and on... Um, uh, on council. So uh, don't ever apologize for sharing your voice. I really appreciate everyone's one's contributions, especially on uh, things like this. It's really, really good to hear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so maybe I can, uh, unless you, you, you have a comeback for uh, Courtney with um, Douglas. Uh, nope. No. Uh, All good. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we'll finish the, this uh, section with a question or two from me or a comment more. Um, I'd just like to side with several people who said the preference, their preference was for uh, the bi directional protected bike lanes rather than bikes using the multi use pathways. Um, my, my feeling is multi use pathways work well when there's very little bike traffic. Um, so if you're expecting a lot of bike traffic on this, on this road, then I think, uh, the protected by bi bi-directional bike lanes are the way to go. Um, and that raises the issue. Well, then that's going to cut the, the number of traffic lanes down to two. I'm just wondering if you've considered a three lane traffic lane all the way through, uh, which switches at noon. Oh, like a reversible. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'll definitely have to bring that back to the table because, of course, um, some roadways can accommodate that quite, I guess, easier. Um, of course, we definitely would have to bring that back to the table and see if that could be applied in the corridor. And what we did here is that a lane instruction within a dedicated left turn lane may be stronger than having a reversible lane through the corridor. Um, but that's great feedback. And we'll keep that in mind as we're looking at the options. Okay. Um, yeah, I just feel it's, it's a, a way to to go ahead yeah. with the bi-directional bike lanes. Um, okay, well, thanks a lot for everyone for their comments. And as I said, uh, you have an opportunity to uh, submit further comments um, in, in the way that was mentioned. So let's carry on. Uh, item eight is information items brought forward and there are none. Item nine is a staff update on projects and plans. And I believe Siobhan, uh, Witherby will be giving that. Yes, hello. Um, hi, Mr. Chair and members of ATAC. Um, Siobhan Witherby, I'm an active transportation planner with HRM. I'm here representing Dave McIsaac um, this evening. He's left me with a list um, for our update. But before I do that, I just wanted to thank Courtney for that awesome presentation and for doing ATAC and then running off to an engagement meeting later today. What a what a champion. Um, we, we really appreciate the work that you're doing that on um, Woodside Shearwater. So it's I'm going to hop into, <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have a good session tonight. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm going to hop through our list of updates from the AT team. Um, updates on active transportation grant programs. Um, the AT grants for 2022 2023 were evaluated, approved, and awarded. So far, a total nearing $450,000 um, was awarded from this year's budget. And if you'd like, a presentation with um, details on this can be prepared for the next session, but we'll leave it in your hands to um, request that if you think it would be um, helpful for you. Um, next category, we have our, our Grams Grove Dartmouth East functional planning project. Um, we've reviewed proposals and are about to award um, to a consultant. We're going to be kicking off in the next couple of weeks. Um, engagement is likely happening in late July, early August for that project. Another update from Megan, our seasonal bike corrals are almost fully installed. Um, there were some delays um, this year because we were refurbishing a few of them. They had gotten damaged, uh, particularly the planters. Um, been a little bit weathered over the past few years, but we've got five locations, one on Charles Street um, in front of On V, one on Cornwallis Street at Dee Dee's Ice Cream, one on Clyde Street in front of the Garden Restaurant, one on Octorloney in Dartmouth in front of Two of By Sea, and one now on Portland near Whiskey's Lounge. So we're happy to have those in. Next, um, we're just finishing up preparing the RFP for the Slater Street Functional Planning Project. Um, so that'll be launched this summer, collect connecting um, Dartmouth North up to um, Dahlia Street and Octorloney at um, Star Park. Also a little offshoot to Nantucket where we now have that um, multi-use pathway built as part of Wise Road. Um, so we do also have public engagement planned on that for late fall 2022. Um, we're starting a Dartmouth East um, functional planning project, which includes Woodlawn Road, an area kind of um, up into Montebello. So that'll be launched this summer with public engagement in the fall. So lots on the go. And Chloe is also finishing up the Dartmouth North functional planning project. Um, so we're writing the report right now and we'll pr present that to um, regional council in the fall. So you should have received, ATAC should have received a staff presentation on the project, but it's um, moving along quite well. Um, some things that were happening with Dawn, we held um, the North Preston public meeting and celebration about their AT plan um, just a few weeks ago. There is sidewalk going in on Kane Street. It's been tendered, but not yet awarded, but we still anticipate to be um, building that first piece of sidewalk in North Preston this summer. So it's a critical connection between um, the school and the community center that we're very excited about. There was a public meeting out in Lucasville um, to talk about the multi-phase plan to extend a multi-use pathway out to Lucasville. Um, that was held on April 30th and we had surveys on Shape Your City. And now we're just kind of working on the detailed segment planning and the phasing of how that can be built out to connect into Sackville. Um, the Cherry Brook Lake Loon AT planning is currently underway um, with a local committee and we're possibly hiring a consultant um, to do up a functional plan for AT um, connections in that community and propose some future public engagements. Um, we have a project on Arclo Drive to Perrin Drive. Um, AT planning is currently underway um, in Forest Hills on the Trans Canada Trail to connect into the Bissett Trail. I'm gonna take a breath and continue going. <laughs> we have a lot on the go. <laughs> um, so this is coming from my camp. We're excited that um, we're planning for the implementation of 8.9 kilometers of tactical bikeways this summer. Um, so that consists of 1.8 kilometers of protected bike lanes, for example, the curbs and the bollards, um, where the existing painted bike lanes will be upgraded. Um, 7.1 kilometers are bikeway improvements on those quieter local streets. Um, Right now, our internal review is taking place just to kind of get all the stamps we need in order to um, install those. And uh, we hope it to be kind of phased install through the summer by our new tactical operations team, which is great that we now have that capability internally. Um, another piece is that we have been working on a draft of the pocket bike map um, in the regional center. So we brought that up as um, kind of an information item. I wanted to invite ATAC um, to review and provide your comments on this pocket bike map. This is the draft. And um, I've sent along the PDF um, copies to the group. And there's also a link um, where you can actually drop the pinpoints into the online version and specify um, especially where your comments would be. So that is open until June the 30th. And we'd really love your perspective on how to make this pocket bike map the best it can be. And it will kind of live um, alongside this larger regional um, 
bike map, which is it shows the whole municipality. But once we finalize the smaller map, we'll update this to match the style a little bit um, better. So we appreciate your feedback on that. And if anyone wants a hard copy to look at, um, send us an email and we'll, we'll lend you one because it's nice to actually see it in your hands. Um, for the Midtown Bikeways project, um, we've just We've just completed some additional topographic survey work and tree ass assessment, um, which is needed to inform the recommended designs, which we will present to the public as part of phase two engagement shortly, um, likely late summer or early fall. Um, we've talked about the Woodside Shearwater public engagement process, which is underway. We hope that um, you might be able to join us at one of those or provide your feedback on the um, online survey, which, ju which just went live right before this meeting. Um, and that online survey will be available until June 30th as well. For the Peninsula South Complete Streets project, um, phase two public engagement will launch in the first week of July and will continue to the end of the month. Engagement activities include an online interactive map, which will allow participants to review and comment on the Complete Streets concepts, small virtual group discussions, there will be a Shape Your City survey and a few pop-up sessions as well. Um, in addition, we're developing um, four short videos that will help to communicate some of these concepts to the public, which we're really excited about um, seeing and sharing those because I find um, that's really useful for people to participate. And more information will be posted on the Shape Your City website next week. So that's shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash peninsula dash south dash complete dash streets. You can go check that out. And last but not least, um, we have Terminal Road Protected Bike Lanes and the extension of the Hollis Street Protected Bikeway um, south to Barrington Street. So where the Hollis Street Bikeway currently ends at Terminal Road, um, we will be extending that um, as the unidirectional protected bike lanes um, from Hollis and Terminal all the way around the corner um, to meet Barrington Street. And also building a, um, a bikeway on Terminal Road um, one-way protected bike lanes, yeah, unidirectional on term Terminal Road um, from Hollis to Lower Water Street. So the detailed design is wrapping up and we're doing the pretender review meeting next week um, and construction could begin in August. There, so that is a whole lot of information. Um, if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them the best way I can. If not, I can um, write them down and get back to you um, once I've spoken with David. Well, thank you very much, Siobhan. And yes, you're right, that, that's a lot to absor absorb or take in, um, but we'll try. Um, let's go through our speaking list again, uh, starting with Andrew Taylor. Andrew, you need your audio on. <laughs> I'm over for two on that count. Uh, yes, I have no, I have no, no comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, Milena. Thank you, uh, Hugh. Um, hi, Siobhan, nice to see you today again. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you too. This is great, we're crossing paths a whole bunch this week. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I don't remember everything you said there, but holy, <laughs> holy hot cow. Um, yeah. Um, I, the, the terminal road, is is that gonna is that gonna conflict because the 2025 is proposing to there's that big project that will be to redevelop all of lower water street um and i believe it is running up to terminal road um so i guess my question there is if a if a bike lane is going in terminal road it, is that not a waste of money before the other project starts or yeah. If you could answer so that. I believe that um, Mark Mark Nainer has been working with um, the transportation planning team. I believe it's been Lean Romane and Adam Lanigan who are working on the Water Street plan, yeah. and um, I'm sure that they're talking to make sure that those two um, routes are integrated. Um, one thing about what's happening on Terminal Road is it's just the precast curbs and bollards pinned down into the asphalt, so it's a little bit more interim um, and um, less costly um, so that when it comes time to recap the full road like you might be talking about in 2025 um, they can pour the curbs into the correct places and get it all all done up nicely um, in the permanent alignment at that time okay thank you I, I had another question about one of the projects but it's completely slipped my mind so if, if I if I if we go around again uh, it'll probably come to me or I know where to reach you <laughs> thank you okay, perfect thanks <laughs> Okay, thank you, Helena. Um, Elizabeth Pugh. 
Or it always takes a little bit longer to hit buttons than it should. Um, no, thank, nothing really. Um, thanks, Javon. Um, I was just sitting there listening, and I've been on this committee for a long time, and um, I was just kind of hit by a wow. Like, I don't know if the people who are newer on this committee appreciate the huge exponential strides that HRM has taken with this stuff. It's kind of blowing my mind today. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a positive note. Um, Peter Zimmer. Um, <laughs> thank you for the great list. I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to everything. Um, I've seen a piece of language that you planners use talking about tactical road interventions, i.e. Bell Road and Sackville Street, places like that. Well, your tactics were implanted or executed a year and a half ago. They have seemingly some widely acknowledged failures and being kind of really unbike friendly at some of their extremes <clears throat> and not very well signed and all of that. And I wonder about a tactical, uh, tactical plan that really doesn't respond in three months or six months. Um, you know, when you make an intervention, I would think a priority should be a really active searching out for feedback to see, did the tactic work the way you thought it would? You know, mm -hmm. and not whether it irritates people or not, but whether people in their behaviors actually act the way you thought they would. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, in, in the next three months, you make the changes again and keep iterating that until you get it right. I mean, that's, that's tactical road manipulation in my mind. Uh, it's 18 months since you put in the tactical corners at the, you know, I think it's been winter twice through the tactical at Bell Road and Sackville Street. And it's no, no writer now than it was when it was first put in, and, you know. Right. Yeah, no, that's fair, Peter. That's fair. Um, I, I know that engagement is supposed to be a component of these tactical um, installments. Um, they're nimble and easier to shift and change um, so that we can kind of reflect some of those comments. Um, I can't speak directly to um, the corner of Sackville and South Park Street. Um, my, my thought on that may be that they were hoping it would be caught in the Midtown um, AAA bikeways engagement process because that corner will be um, rehabilitated in kind of the permanent way um, as part of that project. But um, I've definitely, I can bring that back to the team um, to flag that some more engagement needs to be done. I know we've been talking about accessibility at that corner as well and doing a site walk um, with some folks who use white canes or with low vision um, to make sure that um, all users can navigate through that area. Um, I know with the 8.9 kilometers of tactical bikeways we were talking about this summer, we also have an opportunity to kind of go back um, to the public and, and talk to them about how it's working. Um, I, I would say the municipality is a little bit slower. Like sometimes it takes three months for people to really experience the facility and set down their transportation patterns and get used to using it um, before we start making those shifts. So it might be more of like a six month, nine month, one year type um, scenario unless, yeah, it depends on the extent of the comments if it's creating um, a large safety issue in which we can go out and um, make some some quicker fixes but um, it's something that we're still kind of learning about um, as a municipality but I'm I'll bring that back to the group about uh, making sure that we're more intentional and widespread with some of that post tactical engagement okay thanks Peter one, one other related observation is when you're making these kinds of changes uh, as a cyclist coming upon them there's no information at the site or as a pedestrian uh, I do know I've seen some photos from Paris where they do very nice advanced signage. Oh, it's going to be three months before any construction starts here, but this is what we're going to be doing at this corner. And there's a way for adding the feedback. It puts useful, clear communication at the point where citizens are going to interact with it. And so, A, it's not a big surprise when all of a sudden the trucks come in and mess up the travel patterns for a week or two. Uh, and B, they have some idea of 
what the intention is, what the payoff is expected to be. And if you're a good salesman, you, you don't start, you know, first you, you deliver the thing and then you deliver your pitch. And town hall meetings and all of that are well and good, but that's not on the ground where the people are, who they, most of the people probably haven't ever gone to one of those meetings, you know. So good communication before you start, you know, you've planned the change. Okay, tell everybody about it right away, clearly, vehemently. Celebrate it because it's good stuff that you're trying to do. No, nope, that's great feedback, okay. um, Peter. I know that we've been focusing our education on some of our web materials. Like we've gone out and filmed some how-to videos and put resources on the website. But I agree, if you have something that's actually on the ground that people can see and have the explanation there. I've also gotten into um, QR codes from this experience with the bike map. So if we can have like a little QR code that people can link to um, to provide their feedback, I think that could be really, really cool. That, yeah, that might be a good way to bring people I have the QR codes on the advanced signage might yeah. be a good way to bring people to your website where you can explain in more depth. But, yeah. you know, first things first. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you, you touched a raw nerve there with, for me, Peter, because um, we recently had tactical work on Eisner Boulevard. That was a complete surprise to the whole community and raised a furor among users, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, it was not, not the way to go. There has to be a heads up if, that when this work is coming. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to Brittany McLean. No, nothing from me, thanks. Okay, Brittany, thank you. Douglas Webmore. Douglas? Guys, uh, I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch that three or four times before I'm ready for any questions. So <laughs> it's a lot thank to you observe, very much. So you can follow up by email as well if, if anything comes up after the fact. Perfect, thank you. Okay, okay that leaves, uh, well, that leaves several others, I guess. Uh, Annika Ropel. Hi, um, I will echo Elizabeth. It's really exciting to hear all of these projects um, coming down the pipeline and it, it's stuff that I feel like we've been hearing people complain about for years. So it's nice to be able to be like, it's actually going to happen. Um, and then personally, I'm also excited. Um, I'm going to jump on Peter's train about the tactical urbanism and I, I had written down QR codes. Um, but yeah, just even the idea of having a sign at the site uh, um, for that on the ground kind of um, feedback to people, even if it's very clear that says, you know, this is tactile infrastructure, it's temporary. If you have comments, please send them here or put the, submit them here, and we will be re, you know we will be revisiting this and making those changes. But it's it really does feel like that thing where people, in order to feel like they're being heard, they also need that timeline of like when like it's it you know you're not promising that like we're going to come out tomorrow and move this concrete barrier four feet over. It's like we're going to take all this information over this time period. And then we're going to reassess and your information will be seen and heard. So I, I really do like tactical infrastructure, but it definitely lacks that, that the immediacy of implementing tactical infrastructure should also have an immediacy of being able to respond to it as well. So that is cool and fun and yay QR codes. Um, thanks COVID for that. And I, I, yeah, like everyone else, I don't have other comments. I, that was a lot of stuff, so exciting. Okay, thank you, Annika. Uh, Miles McCormick. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I don't have any comments or questions. Okay, Miles. Um, I just have one question, actually. Uh, you gave us a long list, very impressive, as everyone is say saying, but um, there was no mention of the Portland Hills um, Greenway improvements at the Baker Drive end. Uh, where where does that stand? Because it's in the budget. I, I, budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have the answer for that um, offhand, but I can follow up with Dave McIsaac and get back to you. So that's um, Portland Hills at Baker Drive. Well, he's calling it Portland Hills, but in fact, it's Portland, the Portland Lakes Greenway. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll follow up with you on that, Hugh. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, all right, very good. Uh, we'll. Um, Move, move on. Thank you again, Siobhan. Um, you. We have um, 
committee committee member updates. I, I asked for a brief uh, opportunity to inform you of a panel discussion that I was recently part of uh, with the Canadian Institute of Transportation Engineers. Uh, this was a, a an on-site conference in Vancouver, but unfortunately, I was stuck at home on Zoom. <laughs> um, but it was a very interesting panel because this, the, it was actually called Citizen-Led Active Transportation Committees, and with reference particularly to the issue of equity. And uh, there were representatives from um, Vancouver uh, City. Uh, there was um, myself from Halifax, obviously. Just gonna get my notes. Um, there was a uh, the chairperson of the region of Waterloo, ATAC. Uh, there was uh, a member from the North Grenville uh, Active Transportation Committee. That this is a more rural area south of Ottawa. And there was a representative from Dollar des Ormeaux, which is a suburb of Montreal, a separate city, suburb of Montreal. Um, so th that was a good cross section. And, and it made us, of course, all aware of the fact that rural issues are definitely in a different uh, situation than, than the, the, the more uh, suburban and, and urban areas. And of course, this committee has tended to focus on the suburban and urban areas, but HRM is a vast area. Uh, and there are lots of rural trail groups uh, that are active. Um, it was interesting to look at the mandate of these various committees, the terms of reference. And uh, I discovered that uh, the region of Waterloo terms of reference was very similar to ours, uh, which was comforting. Um, Vancouver was different in that they actually advise council on strategic priorities. In other words, they see their role as basically developing a master plan for active transportation. Whereas we are required by our terms of reference to actually follow uh, the existing, um, just gonna, our mandate is to advise the transportation standing committee on all matters relating to AT using the active transportation plan as a guide. So we're required to follow an existing plan Vancouver are actually developing a plan. Um, Waterloo region, they're following an existing transportation master plan as well, by the way. This is the only committee that does not report directly to council of those five. And that seems kind of odd. We are reporting to the Transportation Standing Committee, which is a subcommittee of council. Um, so we don't have any direct route through to council, and I suspect we're somewhat ignored for that reason. Uh, essentially, uh, well, and we don't do much in the way of reporting even to the Transportation Standing Committee, by the way. Basically, we're, we're operating with ourselves and staff, and we're providing a lot of input and commentary to staff. Um, but there's very little that gets from our committee to the Transportation Standing Committee, except for Councillor Kent, that's another interesting thing. Uh, where we have 15 required members of this committee, three of them are supposed to be councillors. We have only one councillor that usually attends and a second that sometimes attends. And that's kind of odd. It tells me again that maybe we're not on the radar very much in terms of council and the Transportation Standing Committee. Um, so that's, a, that's another issue. Um, I think those are the main points I wanted to make. I mean, I have I could tell you a lot more. Um, the unfortunately, the session, the panel session, was not recorded, which I found very strange. So it's not available. Otherwise, I would give you the URL and you, I'd send you to the whole thing. The whole thing lasted about forty-five minutes. Um, so I don't know if you have it. This is basically a, you know, an information item. Um, I, I guess I, my overall feeling coming out of that panel was we are actually fairly focused on specifics rather than generalities and, and sort of 
uh, overall strategic planning, we are much more focused on the, the, the nitty gritty of the infrastructure. Several of these committees really did very little in terms of infrastructure. So I think personally, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, it maybe we'd like to have more input into the overall strategic planning. And also, you know, question, for example, what Peter's been talking about, do we actually want to incorporate um, an emphasis on micro mobility, even if it's not human powered? We're actually required by our term of reference to only look at human powered active transportation currently. So that would actually perhaps need a change in our terms of reference. <coughs> Excuse me. And that would have to be approved by council, overall council. Anyway, so that's my brief report. Um, maybe I can quickly go through the, the, um, the list, but probably easiest if you just raise your hand, if you have a question or comment on that. Do I see any hands raised? Three, three hands are raised. So Elizabeth Pugh, is you, you're the first one. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the councillor thing. Um, I have been on the committee for quite a long time, and I think this is the first time there's only really been one active councillor. But in previous years, there's almost always been three or, or two um, that right. regularly show up and do things. So I think it really just depends on, mm. I, I think councillors get to sort of um, say what they're interested in and they get put on committees. So I think it just depends on who gets chosen and, and how interested they are. And of course, how busy they are. So I just wanted to make that comment. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Katie Campbell, you have your hand up. Hi, um, I can probably speak a little bit to how this process works with getting into transportation standing committee and getting a bit more information from them. I'm also the legislative assistant for the transportation standing committee. So I work with them all the time. But what I would recommend doing when you're trying to like kind of get the ball rolling a bit more is bringing members from ATAC forward to transportation standing committee to make presentations and things like that. Cause you're allowed to present to those committees whenever you feel like it. It just goes through like a similar agenda review process that we have and the chair would decide whether or not that presentation would be approved. So for example, Peter put in a presentation request and he's been approved to present at the next transportation standing committee meeting, which is next week. So I'm gonna connect with Peter a bit more to talk about that, but that's those are kind of the opportunities to have like almost a more open forum conversation with the members directly rather than submitting correspondence. Cause then you can kind of get a bit of feedback, but correspondence, they don't necessarily have to act on if that makes sense and then the second thing I would say is working to like draft some motions that would get pushed through transportation standing committee that would make it to council so you need that like direct um, motion that would say the transportation standing committee rec recommends that Halifax Regional Council does blah 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 like the next whatever you want to want to talk about but I do think going in and presenting directly to the committee would be a really good way to kind of like show your presence a bit more and also kind of voice your opinions about not having enough counselors come in and participate and things like that. So that's something that we can work on. And if anyone wants to like make presentations or talk about presentations, I'm always here. I work with transportation standing committee quite often, like just as much as I'd work with this committee. So I'm open to like helping you guys in any way to like get a bit more presence that way. That's okay, fine. thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I, and my understanding is we can make recommendations to mm -hmm. the Transportation Standing Committee, yep. um, and we could even request them to, yep. you know, to, to move something to, to the main council. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Melen, uh, now... I have Sorry, a can I just ask a question related to that before we yes. get on to another topic? I'm just sure. curious. Uh, you just mentioned, Katie, that Peter was going to be uh, presenting to Transportation Standing Committee. Mm -hmm. Is that on behalf of this committee or is that on behalf of himself? Because I don't it remember this committee ever saying, yes, Peter, take this forward. No, it'd be an independent presentation. Okay. But um, he is a member of the Act Transportation Advisory Committee. So in a gender review, I just said, Peter gave this presentation at Act Transportation and 
mentioned that this is something that would possibly go forward to the TSC. So that's kind of how it's going about it, but it is considered from Peter, not from ATAC, if that makes sense. Yes, okay, yeah. thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, my understanding is uh, Peter is not speaking for ATAC. Peter, Peter is speaking for himself, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's an independent presentation. It would just be, say, like any member of the public could go in and talk about your guys' terms of reference if that's what they wanted to. So it's still an individual presentation. It's not on behalf of ATAC. Yeah. Uh, which wouldn't stop us as, as a committee if we wish to discuss a particular issue, including uh, discussing our terms of reference, we could then decide uh, to move for a recommendation to the Transportation Planning Committee. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a possibility, I think. So, M Milena, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm actually in the, in the discussion before I put up my hand there, a lot yeah. of answers have been um, um, uh, questions have been answered here. Um, I, and this is just a thought that perhaps what you read to us, um, Hugh, in the meeting that you were at would be uh, a worthy, you know, hop over to Transportation Standing Committee. Um, and just to say, um, as Katie mentioned, you know, our concern about only having one counselor um, and everything else that he would, you had listed to just to see what their thoughts are as well, because I, I wonder as well, sometimes the, um, the, the notes from our, from our meetings are, and I know that they can't be all, you know, elaborate, but they are quite vague. So I think some of the important intricate suggestions coming from each member of this committee gets missed in some of the notes. Um, and, and that's nothing against, uh, you know, our, our secretary note takers. It, it's, and I understand things have to be condensed, but bringing that kind of stuff, or I would agree with you. Um, and as Katie mentioned, if we can do that, then at some point, maybe we could bring that concern to the TSC. End of thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I suppose. Um, I mean, I could I could ask to appear before the TPC, but again, it would really be me me talking for myself, even even for myself in the role of chair. It would not be me speaking on behalf of the whole committee. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, maybe we, we should think about this in our next meeting. Maybe we should have a, a general discussion on, on how we might relate better to the Transportation Standing Committee. So, um, well, with that, I think we should, should move on to our, um, close to the end of our uh, agenda here. Um, the added items, I asked for uh, Katie to add an item simply to inform you about a video that Milena has produced uh, or stars in. Uh, um, and it's a video, video on navigating built environment obstacles for people with low or no sight. And I just want to, to mention this to you and urge you in fact, to look at it uh, to, to uh, because I, 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 I looked at this, it's about 45 minutes, I think, and I found it both very, well, very instructive uh, and very uh, enlightening in terms of the special needs of people with low or no sight. And it, it's, it's an excursion around Milena's neighborhood um, where she points out a whole series of issues uh, and concerns. Milena, would you like to add something to that? Sure, I'll just say briefly, it, it's not really part of, um, you know, active transportation. It, it's pre predominantly about construction and what is happening in our city. Um, and there are several councillors who are probably very sick of me at this point, but um, I will not uh, stop. Um, and it's a good way just to educate uh, people. Uh, one of the things that I, it, the video was done by Reachability, uh, by the way. Um, there is some profanity that has been beeped out because I didn't know that they were recording all the way through. Um, and it, it just goes to show that it's not just about the blind and partially sighted during construction, but it's about every single pedestrian. Um, 
no matter how old or, or able-bodied or whatever the case may be, whether you're a wheelchair user or, you know, a walk with mobility aid or you're, again, a parent with kids, so on and so forth. And what I've noticed in my 28 years of being blind is that even my close friends who are fully sighted and able-bodied, if there is an obstruction on the sidewalk, your ability to walk around that is very easy. You see it, you move around and you don't think about it. And when I start to point that out, there is quite a lot of responses coming to me saying, oh, right, I did see that I just walked around it. It never occurred to me to report it to 311 and second uh, to let you know. So it's just, it's a bit of, it's more of an awareness. It's not about the Active Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, and then there is uh, something in the built environment that if you're going into buildings and take note of the, the tactile entrance systems that actually have no voiceover, they do not speak, and therefore they are completely and utterly leaving those of us who are blind and partially sighted out of a building because we cannot get in to let our friends know that we're downstairs. So it's, it, is, it is entertaining, I'm told. I, I have watched it. Um, and, uh, and if you've got the time on the weekend and you're bored and not got nothing to do, take a look. Um, and that's all I'll say. So, <laughs> and thanks, you. Okay. Yeah, and, and I somewhat disagree with you. It definitely is about active transportation in terms of the special needs of blind or, or low vision pedestrians, because it's not just, uh, I, I know part of it was about you know, the construction uh, sites making things even more difficult. But even without that, I, I found it very instructive to see what a blind person looks for or, or feels for, I should say, um, on, on the, the sidewalk and, and navigating, uh, particularly intersections, for example. I found that very useful. Uh, so just to let everyone know, if, if, you, if you didn't notice, uh, Katie did post... Uh, the URL for that site on YouTube. So uh, you can go to that, that and um, hopefully that, that um, web link will also be in the minutes of this meeting. Right. I'll be up it's on the agenda at the very, very bottom of it in actually small type as it shows up in mine. But it is worth clicking to. I'm about halfway through watching it and it's really good and yeah. I think our active transportation is the wrong word. We're about human mobility. We're about how do you get around to do the human stuff you want to do with your goods, whatever stuff you have to carry or want to carry. And that's whether you're a big business or an individual. But uh, a minor rant, Doug, you said something about you don't, you don't bike there because bikes don't belong there. My feeling is I want to be able to bike to every address in this city on our commons, the streets and pavements and pathways that the city provides. I don't want to be seen as, no, I don't belong on this street because I'm on a bike or because I'm using a pogo stick or, be, you know, it's, the city is our commons and we get to go where we want and we get to choose the kinds of means we do with some civil constraints, but they aren't absolute laws or not. You are forbidden, you know, any more than they would dare forbid us if one's skin was a different color or if one was over six and a half feet tall or, you know, <coughs> over 90. We have to say it's ours. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, so that was the added item. Um, the last, I guess the last thing here is the date of our next meeting. Please note it's July 21st. Um, and I assume there probably will be a summer break after that with no meeting in August. Uh, also, if, unless there's a reasonably full agenda, we, you know, there may not be a July meeting either, but you'll find out soon enough, I'm sure. Uh, so keep that date, July 21st. With that, uh, we need a motion to adjourn and no seconder is required. Motion to adjourn. 
Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, and thank you again, everyone for attending and uh, thank you, Katie, for your assistance with running the show. Absolutely. Okay, goodbye. You, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good bye. evening, everyone. Take care. Okay. You there, Katie? I am. Okay.